So you got the ick with gravy Whoa. pretty bad after AVN. I did invite him to come on my podcast as that. a teachable moment. Really, I just wanted to divide our clout. I have more followers than he does, so it was important for me at that day to define to the world, like, okay, this ride is over. I'm done getting you followers. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to That's Offensive. It is Daddy Deals in the building. We have Spencer, Damon Dice, Michael Barrick. Just Howdy, getting everything like confused right now. And we have Lisa Ann with us. Hello, hello, hello. Your wardrobe screams father. We have more trust in that top side than people. Discuss, how was your relationship with your father? Nice. Just saying, why did you left? get the attention you wanted? You need Jesus. That's offensive. I'm so excited. I remember yesterday you were like, to Jack, you were like, so did you do your homework? And I'm like, oh, I'm going to go do some more homework because I wanted to very come good. very prepared. Okay, so let, let's see. What are the top three things you've learned about me since you started book not included? Oh, book not included. Uh, you like sexual friendships. Okay. Ding, 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 one. Okay. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Okay, well, I need to go through these because I'm nervous right now. You Don't go ev- be nervous. Okay. It's just me. It's She's just harmless. me. She's yeah, harmless. I'm a nervous person I'm in general. I'm harmless. Oh, are you? Yeah. I'm How very old anxious. Are you? 25. You'll get over that. Yeah. <laughs> by 30, you stop giving a fuck less, and by 40, you're like, what was I ever worried about? I made it this far, yeah. and everything's fine. You go everywhere with security. Don't go anywhere without security. Do not. Yeah. And right. just the reasons that you ended things with the gravy, the gravy train. Oh, yeah. The the, the walk-off. I yeah. Got, I was like a home run walk-off. I did the fucking stand-up. You know what? There, there's nothing more adrenaline pinching <laughs> than either walking out on a date or standing yeah. up a date. And I started the walking out thing at a Red Lobster in Pennsylvania uh-huh. when I was 16. The Irish And my dip. girlfriend and I drove. And we met these two guys there, and they were just being annoying. We went into the bathroom. I'm like, we've got a bail. Yeah. And there was, like, a little window that went out to the parking lot. And like, we can try. We can get up the trash can. We can fucking bail. And I remember we laughed the whole way home. <laughs> Jumped out a window and, to get out. Yes. <laughs> and left them there. And then I was like, I'm addicted to this feeling. Like, there's nothing yeah. better. And I know where to sit. I always have my keys in my purse. Like, uh-huh. I never leave anything in their car. Like, I'm always ready at any time to just be like, you know what, I've had enough of this person. I like them to think I'm going to the bathroom right now and see how long it takes them before they send the waitress in. I always <laughs> yeah. tell the waitress on the way out, give me 10. Let me have 10 minutes so I can get out of here. The, guy, the guy's just sitting there for like 30 minutes. Like, damn, it's she's amazing. really uh, she's uh, I, I digging do it, in there. I at least do it five times a year of my whole life minimum. And um, in L.A., I did a lot. Because oh, dudes are just stooges percent. when it comes to dating in L.A. I've crawled out <laughs> yeah. past them so they, they're not looking for me. You just got to always know where the bathroom is, where the door is. And you got to always be like, yo, I got to go to the bathroom and just be real sneaky about it. Yeah. You know I mean, scope around. When I used to go on dates, I'd tell guys to like come out with me and my girlfriends to bars. So then I would always say I'm going to the bathroom and just leave the whole bar. But then my friends would be like, Adelia, you, I'm stuck with him now. <laughs> you just leave him with the you yeah. said so you guys deal with this. You <laughs> used to go on dates. So do you not go on dates anymore? I've been celibate for over a year for men. Um, men just, but no one has caught my attention enough to like be respectful, to like give me what I want. I have like a whole list of like check marks and no one. I'm so heartbroken for you right now, actually. <laughs> I have um, a Hitachi. Don't feel that bad for me. I, it's not the same. Uh, but I get it at your age. I get yeah. it more than anything at your age. I think it's easier for me. I'm double your age. Uh-huh. So I think that's easier for me because I have a larger pool yeah. to deal with, right? And no matter what, when you're a woman under 30, men just assume you're not smart. And so they talk down to you a lot. And that's and that's a turnoff, right? That makes it's you feel like you're wasting your time on a date. And you're insulted the whole time. Once you're insulted, like, I always would say to myself, like, my knees are welding shut, which means, like, there's no way we're having sex, right? Yeah. <laughs> my knee, and he'd be talking, and I'd be like, oh, my God, my knees are welding shut right now. Like, I'm probably going to walk out on this date. But it is really tough at your age. But yeah. being celibate, do you get regular massages? What do you do for human contact? Oh, what do I do? I have a dog. So oh, that's not, great. Yeah, I have, I have a little pity dachshund. So it's like, okay, anytime I feel like, oh, I want to cuddle with someone, it's, I got wubs. I, I would say, though, it's really important for your overall body uh-huh. to get regular massages when you're celibate. So I have I'm, acupuncture. There you go. Yeah, okay. acupuncture. Oh, physical therapy. That, yeah. But that's painful. That fucking hurts. But yeah, I definitely do have a lot of... Do you miss the penis? Um, I do, and I don't. <laughs> I have to ask. Like, I, I want, I've never I gone can, a year. I couldn't go that long. Yeah, <laughs> I would, yeah, I would I, lose my shit. I don't miss what's attached to the penis. Oh, but you don't really have to get attached to that. You, you know what I mean? We're trying to teach your detachment and compartmentalize. If I this could week. do That's that, the- I would. But your girl is really bad at that. I'm good with women because I can't see myself dating a woman, but okay. I like to fuck them. Okay. So it's like I can hook up with women and not get that attachment. 
But if a guy gives me good dick, I could hate his personality and I'll be like following him around like a puppy dog. Oh, you can't do that. Um, oh, you have yeah, to I have know. a range of dick that you just enjoy for the dick. It may be a movie. Yeah. You know, maybe you'll hang out, but you don't have to go anywhere in public or eat with them. Like there's guys you don't even break bread with, but you're like, this is going to be good. This is going to be a four hour interaction. Uh-huh. He's coming over. We're going to do this. He's going to leave. I'm yeah. going to flip my sheets. I'm going to get a nice shower. I'm good to go. I was you know? good at that in college. I was okay. great at that in college. And then just the older I got, the more it's like I would just get the icks so easily. So then it's like I can't have a wide range of guys because like this guy already disgusted me. This guy already disgusted me. And then I only have the one guy left. I think I've become a better picker as I've gotten older. But these are all really probably normal things for you at your age. Like yeah. nothing to be overly concerned. This is not life changing. You're just kind of taking a pause to focus on you and not have the distraction of the chaos that maybe some of these guys have brought into your life. Yeah. Well, also I'm like working myself during life coaching. So I don't pick the guys that like disrespect you or like treat you poorly. Um, what about athletes? They're so easy because you can just look at their schedule and know they're only going to be around this day. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so great because they won't be passing through again for four months. You know, and it's fantastic. That's a that's always been my go-to. I'm I like tall, skinny men, basketball players, then ba- oh. tennis players, but some baseball, NBA players. Have you ever like talked to one? A uh, million. Okay, yeah. Oh, that's that's yeah. <laughs> I did. Yeah. <laughs> every day in my life. Every day. They are some of the biggest douchebags I have ever met. Maybe it's different because it's me. Yeah, maybe it's different because it's you. Maybe you think that's what it is that maybe they look at it like because it's a gift. Like I, the the way I meet them first is I wait till they have a big game and then I follow them. But yeah. I wait till forty minutes after the presser because I know that's when they're getting the plane or the team bus. Uh-huh. Then I follow. I don't I don't write a message to yeah. start. Then they'll write a message and then I'll say I had to reach the out. The follows the hook. Game. That's like the yeah. The follows the hook because they're on the plane and they're checking and there's usually other players on the team that I already know and I'll reach out to them and be like, yo. I'm going to hit up so-and-so. Yeah. He scored 54 points tonight. Like, this is my time. Uh-huh. So they'll be like, all right, I'll okay. tell him it's definitely you and not a fake. And I'm like, okay. And so the whole buddy, it's it's a conspiracy. It's just fun. Yeah. But maybe it is different because it's me. Because right away, they're always like, thank you so much for reaching out, Mama. Yeah. Or thank you, Queen. Oh, Mama? It's so nice. That they, the so ath- do they have, like, the stepmom? The only, mama vibes. It's not stepmom. It's just mama. Mom. And it's more more in the black community than the white community okay. so it's more of a queen thing in the black community so it's 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 totally a compliment for them but like if a guy on twitter's like i wish you were my stepmom like he's blocked yeah because that's fucking <laughs> gross so you want to fuck the same person your dad fucks that is <laughs> that's, yeah you're asking my brothers or your dad yes <laughs> yeah it's just gross. so to someone that is a fantasy they want to be asking my brothers or their dad I say that to guys all the time in person. Like when they say, "I wish you were my stuff," I'm like, "That's a, that's a different way to look at it, right there." Yeah, <laughs> like, damn, so like, do you also want to blow your dad or give him a rim job? Because obviously, if you want to fuck the same woman, you're doing the same thing. Yeah, and they always exactly. look at me like, uh, <laughs> "You just fucking ruined my whole fantasy of step." I'm like, "You just the the stocks and like that porn <laughs> went pew." <laughs> So with those like NBA men, you know a lot of them have girlfriends and they're just out there. I won't cheating. fuck with anybody that has a girlfriend. Okay, ever. so you do or your wife. homework. I do my homework. And okay. everyone that I already know, like vets in the league, will tell me the honest truth. Uh-huh. And I make it a very clear thing. And so once they do show a girlfriend or something, I'm always like, hey, cool, we're friends. I always best them congratulations on yeah. your new girl. Um But they still try I to make cheat. It, they don't. They, they know because they everyone the one thing that people know about me is A, I don't kiss and tell. Yeah. And B, I don't fuck around when it comes to that. Yeah. So if you do that to me, it's going to be a big problem. Yeah, my one friend. I is... will have you jumped in the locker room. <laughs> <laughs> I will have a problem happen for you. Yeah. You will not get drafted in the NFL draft. Okay. Oh, yeah. Something bad will happen. I've done all of these things. Okay. That's also awesome. okay because you do sports, and I I don't know anything about sports to be fair. So that's why I didn't do my homework on that. I that's okay. I wouldn't know what the don't fuck worry. I'm reading. Most of my girlfriends have no idea what I do for a living. Like my yeah. girlfriends that aren't in the business. It's or, sports radio, like right? Sports? Yeah, sports. <laughs> they're like fantasy sports Dinner. and betting. And so they'll hit me up when, on Sundays during the season. And I'll be like, they'll be like, what are you doing? I'm like, obviously I'm working. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, I'm watching games. Football like, this day. is work, you know? Yeah. And then they'll ask me a bunch of questions. And I always just say, obviously, you have no idea what I do for a living. And it's okay. Yeah. So I try. Because they don't follow. Yeah. I'm always I- excited when a girlfriend of mine gets into fantasy football. I'm like, can I see your lineup? Like, let me see what your waiver wire looks like. Like, let me log in your shit. Converting them. Were you always into sports? Or is always, that recent? Okay. Always, ever since I was a kid. Yeah. Growing up in Pennsylvania, that was just normal. I played basketball all through school. I ran a little track. Flag football, powder puff league wow. that got discontinued after the first season because we were so violent. <laughs> um, so I've always been into sports. Basketball uh-huh. is my first love. Football was second. I've picked up baseball to stay on air all year because that's one of the yeah. things you have to do. I love UFC. And my secret passion that I don't like to bet on because I love it too much is golf. Okay. So, so I watch every tournament. 
one fighter I know, Jake Paul. What are your thoughts on him? Do you think he's a real fighter? Do you shut on him like a lot of the other people? I think people? he's, you know, I think he's really proved himself to be a real fighter and every yeah. fighter loses a fight, right? Yeah. So he did lose his last fight. But I love what he's done. I got to go to a, one of his events in December of 2021 mm -hmm. and I walked out a fighter and I got to interview a lot of fighters present and he pays the female fighters the same as the male fighters. Now wow. that's never happened in any other sport in the world mm -hmm. so far. Yeah. There's that. He pays them really well and then he gives them a percentage of everything that he's making on Showtime. He gives them a great situation for their families. Like to me, what he's done by pumping the money that he's already made on YouTube and other platforms mm -hmm. into the pockets of other people That's is truly sick. powerful. And then him so and like, Andrew I'm pro Jake Paul. And like when yeah. I first heard of him, I was like, I don't know how I feel about this guy. It was years ago when he was first just a YouTuber. And then as I've gotten to see how he's in business, I'm like, wow, I like this kid so much. Him and Anderson Silva, because Anderson Silva lost, they have like a whole foundation now to help. I mean, like, I had a concussion in December, and I'm still fucking stupid. Like, can you imagine all these fighters? How did it happen? Headbanging accident. I'm a big dubstep gal. Oh, I was dancing. <laughs> my well, okay. To be fair, I was I was like over here headbanging, and my friend was really drunk, and me and her like we like to kind of hook up and fuck when we were drunk. So she's like was getting horny, and she wanted to grind on me, and then just hit my head so fucking hard. And concussions hard. can linger for months. Oh yeah, no, I'm months. so stupid. Like it's you okay. can also have light sensitivity and get nauseous and and your whole equilibrium can be off as well. Mm -hmm. I was dizzy for a whole month. Couldn't drive. Wow. Yeah. So they say you got your bell rung. Yeah, <laughs> that's what they say. Yeah, exactly. So you were married and you say that the marriage life isn't for you. You got divorced. Yeah, it didn't stick. You know, we're still friends. Uh, yeah. I kept his last name because it was easier to pronounce than mine. Oh. Um, <laughs> but we were very young. He was my first boyfriend. He's yeah. the only guy I ever lived with. Uh, we had many great years until it just wasn't great, and we both were really evolving as people. Mm -hmm. um, I tried. I started to change. I never wanted kids. He started to change. He wanted kids, and I was just like, okay, this is where we part ways. I but don't we still talk either. every year on our wedding anniversary, and we talk on birthdays and holidays. That's so cute. Was it such a respectful split that you're like, I can still be friends? It, it's never respectful in the jump, right? Okay. I was the one that had the money, so I was the one that had to be given a number. You mm -hmm. know, So I just we went to a mediator, and I'm like, just put a number on it. I'll pay it because I'm, yeah. like, I'm buying my freedom right now. So it was it was a lot of my savings as a young 30-year-old woman. Uh -huh. Um. And there were like a couple little things that he tried to get. He tried to get my signed Jordan jersey. So I had to get a lawyer for that to fight for that. But he didn't put in the doc signed. Uh -huh. He just put Jordan jersey. That one's worth fighting for. You got to hold I, I had to make five up on yeah, that motherfucker. Like, Jordan <laughs> jersey. Anything but Jordan. Like, come day, on. Okay. But, Stinky. you know, and I think you've got to let it like you. It was we, we had a small agreement that we made the morning of our wedding of three things. Mm -hmm. One, if we didn't make it, he would move back to his respective state and I would stay in mine. He was from Florida, I was from California. Mm -hmm. Two, we wouldn't shit talk each other. Yeah. And three, whatever friends we came in with, we would leave with because I didn't want to keep in touch with his friends and I didn't want him keeping in touch with mine. Yeah. And sense. he was in a moment of panic, hung over the day of our wedding and called me on my cell phone. I remember thinking, oh, we're not supposed to talk today. It's our wedding day. Yeah. And he's like, we don't have a prenup. We don't, you know, I'm freaking out. And I was like, let's just agree on three things. That's what uh -huh. we agreed on. And we stuck to that. Yeah, that's so sweet. So you like sexual friendships I is do. the term that you say. So not friends with benefits. What is the difference between friends with benefits and sexual friendships to you? I think friends with benefits focuses on the friendship a lot and the time that you spend together. Uh huh. And sex is secondary. And I think sexual friendships, it's less time together, more focus on the sex. Yeah. And not mixing the two of them up, right? Because uh -huh. your, your friends with benefits are people that you, like, go to with things. Like, I really choose not to go to with things to the people I'm having a sexual it's relationship It's more of a time with. commitment, too. It's yeah. like, if exactly. you're busy, you don't have time to put into that. Yeah, so it's the like friend you keep it, part keep first means it has to be a priority yeah. first. Who's got time for that? Uh -huh. <laughs> you know what I mean? We don't. Yeah. So does this mean that, like, if you have a sexual friendship with someone you still expect the respect of a friendship while you're fucking them? Well, I don't have very high expectations of people. Okay. I've learned in life that when you lower your expectations, you're it's a easier. lot happier. So I expect nothing from anyone. You know, I just want us to have a good time together. And if it starts to feel uncomfortable or forced, then it's not meant to be anymore. Yeah. But so I don't, you know, there's really nothing anybody can do that will make me feel disrespected. And if they do do something, most likely we won't even discuss it. Example, gravy. I yep. never felt the need to discuss it with him. I just thought of myself. Yeah. And there's power in thinking of yourself and just making your own move. Uh -huh. We don't have to fight everything out. We don't have to tell somebody why. We just do us. And so yeah. I just kind of 
rip the Band-Aid off. So we just slide own. out the back door. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to go and watch some football at my friend's yeah. house instead. Because you got the Iqua gravy pretty bad after AVN. Do you think it was just like the alcohol and being figgity fucked up in Vegas that made him oh, act the way he did? Yeah, I definitely think he got lost in the sauce. <laughs> yeah. Um, lost in the for sauce. For sure. Yeah. Uh, he, Vegas happens. Yeah, Vegas, Vegas happens. happens. And uh, he was very different when I first met him because he, fin- he was just starting a tour. Oh, yeah. So he wasn't really drinking or smoking at all so I get to see who he really is he's a sweet sweet kid mm-hmm. but you put him here with all the girls in Vegas no, no doubt he's getting hate fucked uh, because half the girls in the business hate me yeah so you know it was just a it was a recipe for disaster and it just got to the point where I reached out to my friends that Friday and I was like look I got a dope fucking outfit and I don't think I want to wear it standing next to this cat. Like he's just been with <laughs> some C level skank ass <laughs> bitches all week. Uh-huh. And me just standing by him on the red carpet is fucking lowering my value. And they were yeah. like, save the outfit. And I'm uh-huh. like, okay. And then uh- <laughs> I don't have to wear the outfit. Yeah. So that, that's like an example where like you might not have felt disrespected, but you did feel like there wasn't that respect of a friendship that you needed, right? Fun yeah, today. and like we were at an event. You yeah. were there. We were at an event on I Thursday. There. I was with a group of my friends, and he, he was, was just so fucked up, and just really just around, just just low quality girls, and just not talking to my friends. Not kind. I looked at my friends, and I was like, Ooh. it was it was dark in the room. He's like up up tall, so you can't really see down there. <laughs> it doesn't matter <laughs> the choices that he made over the choices he could have made. Uh-huh. Yeah, he went for like the fucking cheapest fast food burger over like a Kobe steak, you know, mm-hmm. and I just couldn't have that. He just wanted what was like easy and available. A lot of men have like tunnel vision. They can only think about like the pussy that's in front of them. I was right there as well. So, <laughs> yeah, very tunnel vision. Like blackout he was just glasses. being a fucking skank. But yeah, yeah, I definitely think it was drugs and alcohol yeah. as well because he was really different. Yeah, my that friends that all met him in New York, it was just such a great experience, and everybody thought he was super nice. So or his eyes was were just on you. He introduced himself to everybody, and he right? was so nice to my friends as well. Yeah, like he fussed over everybody I had with me, and we had a great time at the show. And I will say, the energy at his show was amazing. It was great uh-huh. to see everybody having a good time. Yeah. Do you think this is a common theme with dating younger men? It really usually isn't with me because most younger men are smarter and like if they have a choice to stand by me or two or three skanks, they're always going to stand by me. So you say... <laughs> it's just an answer. Yeah. Um, when you say skank, <laughs> do you mean... Because like, you know, we've all shown our Floozies? vagina on the internet. So what what is your definition then when you say that um, about If other all of somebody's clothing are not worth the price of the underwear that I'm wearing, it's pretty much a skank. Oh, probably me. <laughs> so I'll take That's that with pride. Sad. High class. I'm just, no, not you at all. But oh, like no, those okay. girls that night, I remember looking over them and, and it was one of my girlfriends was like, oh my God, girl, your bag is worth more than all of their fucking clothes they own. I'm like, I know. And he's like touching on them. Now I can't let him touch on me for the rest of the night. I'm grossed out. <laughs> yeah. And then he went to kiss me that. goodbye. And I was like, no, no, no I no. can't share lips with this boy. That was when it started to fall apart. Yeah, definitely. Do you have any animosity towards him? Nope. That's good. I did invite him to come on my podcast as a that. teachable moment. And his PR wouldn't let him. Write. Yeah, yeah. His PR, his agent, like everybody was up in arms. And my agent was like, I'm so fucking proud of you. I hope that my daughter is like you. Like, <laughs> oh you know, all God. of my people on my team were like, Ball or, you How know, when teachable I, of a moment, though. <laughs> what am teachable, I walking like, myself into here? When I put the post together, of course, I send it out to all my people to make sure that it's not going to really hurt somebody. Yeah, definitely. That it's not going to cause a war or any bad situation. And it was just campy and fun, right? Mm-hmm. And it was just light enough. Really, I just wanted to divide our clout. Uh-huh. You know, I have more followers than he does. So it was important for me at that day to define to the world, like, okay, this ride is over. Yeah, a thousand percent. And like... I'm done getting you followers. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. I'm kind of a dick. Yeah, we love to see that. <laughs> so I'm really nosy. You Please. talk about, you talk about people not liking you in the industry. Why do you think people don't like you or like what's the beef there? You know, it's like I know this is going to be hard for you cuz it's a sports reference, but like okay. LeBron James, you know, so many people talk shit about LeBron. How can you talk shit about LeBron because he's the best player in the NBA because he's been playing for more years than anybody else because uh-huh. he's consistently putting up buckets after buckets. By the way, Joel Embiid 11 games in a row with 30 points. I'm fucking shocked. Uh-huh. Uh, but Kobe was the same way. You know, when Kobe was in his peak, everybody talked mad shit about Kobe. Everyone? Uh, yeah, e- you know, everybody in the, in the sports world. Okay, in the yeah. sports world. When, when somebody is so successful, instead of just praising their success, 
quite often people start to try to break that person down. So uh-huh. that animosity is very common in a highly competitive business. Yeah. The adult business is highly competitive. If there's a club that has dance bookings six times a year, only six girls can get them. And yeah. 50 girls want them. Uh-huh. So when you're the one getting booked everywhere you want to go and you're doing everything you want to do, there becomes this divide. And I was never there to make friends. I never had friends in the industry. My friends were always outside of the industry doing other things for work, and that really kept me level-headed. Yeah. But when it comes down to it, it can get very vicious. And when you read kind of, you know, the intro to my book, um, that whole situation you read about Mm -hmm. came from inside the business. And I would let people stay at my house a lot in L.A. when they would travel in from other cities to shoot. So they knew the layout of my home. And that night when the cops arrived, the cops were like, okay, you've lived here 10 years. We've never had a problem like this. The caller said they were coming from upstairs, downstairs to your couch to kill you. This is somebody that knows your home recovering from surgery. This is somebody that knows the layout of your home. And this is somebody that you're in a Twitter beef with right now. And they like laid it all out because one of the young cops knew of the Twitter beef. And and was and so it just became this whole and so that was really incited and did they he, find the guy? It wasn't a guy. It was a girl that started oh. it. Wow. Was um, it was it like a voice? What is it like? Voice manipulator? Or was it a girl? Oh, the, the guy that left the voicemail message. Yeah, yeah. No, that was a guy. Okay. But it was a girl that started rallying all these people. Oh together wow! So it was like to, a collusion, oh. multiple oh, people. Oh, it wow. was this so. Like it was so dr- big. Mystery drama stuff right here. Oh my god. Um, it was so big. I mean, they were convincing producers were posting my model releases on social media so like your name your address my name my address my rate like more than anything people finding out my rate was fucking the most offensive thing to people they had already put my social up there my driver's license like my i had already been completely doxxed yeah but then it got to my family because you know your maiden name your mother's maiden name can be on your model releases depending Uh how deep they go um and that whole thing consumed a year of my life just the harassment and then it took me a whole nother year to really take a beat and just be still and process all of it. Like, cause it changed my life. It changed my relationships with my friends. It changed my living situation because I would be at my apartment in New York and they would fuck with my neighbors by calling in the door, the, you know, the buzzer door Mm. saying we just murdered her inside her house. Then the cops come and break my fucking door down. So then I've got to go and fucking buy a new door frame, put a new door up. But I mean, I'm in New York. I got to fly back. It was so much chaos that when it finally stopped being that much chaos because that person got into something with somebody else and I was kind of off the hook for a period of time. Once it simmered down, it just took me a while to like absorb what happened, yeah. you know, and process all of it. It was hard on my friends because they were very afraid for me. Yeah. Everybody was like in heightened mode of like, oh my God. You know, and I went through this whole mental anguish of, is this the karma I get for being in the business? You yeah. know, it's just like I went through every process of elimination why did this happen to me and then I just finally let it go Mm -hmm. I said this is out of my control I went to church every fucking weekend (laughs) and just sat in there to have faith that this was going to end I grabbed it every straw I could I got all the alcohol out of my home didn't drink for two years Uh uh, because I was like okay alcohol is a depressant all I need to do is sit here and fucking drink I'll smoke a ton of weed but I'm not (laughs) going to drink Uh just really regulated myself during that time to limit the risk is that part of the reason why you left the industry? Because you're like, this is the drama that comes with it? It was when I left the industry that that happened. Okay. So that's what caused it. The knee-jerk reaction to me leaving the industry was what caused it. What prompted you to want to leave the industry? I was just done. You know, I had set a financial goal for myself. I had started a new career in sports radio. Mm-hmm. And I told myself if I get signed to a second contract, then I'm going to make this my thing. And I'm going to yeah. really focus on this. And I could still do, like, club events. Like, I I decided I was just going to break away. This was 2014. Mm -hmm. Um, In 2013, we had a really rough year in the industry. We were shut down for more than half of the year for different outbreaks, HIV, syphilis. Like, Mm -hmm. there were. it was just like, and so in my mind, I was like, okay, you have the money that you came here to get. Mm -hmm. Uh, You're too lucky that nothing serious has been put in your life that you have to take care of for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And if you continue to take this risk, you're just like walking a tightrope. So it was like a lot of different factors. Yeah. And it was time. It was changing a lot. I didn't love the scenes. I loved scenes certain way. I didn't love, like, I hated stepmom stuff. Mm -hmm. I hated incestual stuff. So it just became this, like, if I wasn't producing my own movies, 
I would have to spend like four days on the phone with the company of like, what's the scenario going to be? What's going to happen? I need to prove the script. Like, mm-hmm. I need to know everything. And so that just became a drain, took away from the fun of going on set and doing a And that's when all scene. that stuff was trending was when you were on the tail end of your career. That's when all the stepmom stuff started coming out. So that yeah. was like the big thing in 2013, 2014. I was out. Because when I first came in, like my first scenes are steps on like 80% of the time. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. eight, eight out of 10 shoots as a steps on. I was like, damn, I've got so many stepmoms. Like, it's crazy. And I didn't love it. <laughs> I had and mommy I issues just after thinking, this. Like, I just remember thinking like, isn't it enough that we're exposing ourselves this way? Why do we have to fuck with other people? Like, I'm not mm-hmm. a stepmom. Like, I don't want to fuck with other stepmoms. Like, you know, the whole thing just, that's where it started twisting my mind. I was like, this isn't just fun anymore. Yeah. Do you think it's gross when, like, a stepdad who is an actual stepdad watches stepdad porn? Do you think they're fantasizing about their daughters? Or do you think they just <sighs> like it because it's, like, naughty? That's a slippery slope, right? Yeah, I never really thought about that, but that is a slippery slope. Like the whole thing is putting the wrong message out to the <laughs> world. Like you could just have sex without, if you gotta go to family? some weird fucking story in your mind to get your rocks off, then you need therapy. Like you should be able to masturbate and come. You should mm-hmm. be able to have sex and come. You shouldn't have to be like, okay, somebody's breaking into my house. That's the only way. And it's gotta be a stepdad. Like, yeah, I see that all the time. Like mom's posting like, my husband, my do- like kid stepdad is like looking up stepdad porn and they're like, do I I'd need to hide concerned. my kid? I'd be concerned yeah. about that. I, whenever kids are like, I wish you were my stepmom. I, if I don't tell them how gross I think it is because they're fucking the same woman that's fucking their dad, mm-hmm. I'll say you to them. You can ask my brothers with your dad. It's yeah, kind of, if you think like, about it, it's like, oh. I'll say, like, you know oh. what? Um, <laughs> nah. I wouldn't be a great stepmom. You'd be doing fucking chores all day. <laughs> yeah. You'd be running all my fucking errands. You'd be doing all my fucking laundry. Like, why do you want, what the fuck are you thinking? This is going to be a free ride? Think I'm going to take care of you? What was the moment you knew you didn't want kids? I feel like mine was when I got nauseous every time I was in the vicinity of one. I just knew um, I didn't fly as a kid. My first flight was to get in the business in my yeah. early 20s. I wanted to be free and see the world. I grew up in PA. We went to Jersey Shore in Florida, and that's it. Mm-hmm. And I just wanted to expand my world, and I knew that kids would impede me for doing that. My, both yeah. of my parents truly suck as humans, so I knew I wouldn't have a family to share kids with. Like, yeah. how do you have kids? You have no grandparents. You have no relatives. Mm-hmm. You have none of that. And... I kind of thought it was important for me to break the chain. Yeah. So kind of going back to your parents, do you think that, you know, everyone on like TikTok or Instagram are like, oh, you guys are whores because of daddy issues or they like try to use daddy issues as an insult. And I'm like, first of all, that's kind of insulting the dad. I don't know why y'all are using it to insult me. But a lot of people assume that people in porn do it because of their issues with their dad. Do you think you were kind of born to do that or do you think that you did it in spite a little bit. You know, porn has always been, you know, referenced as the home of broken toys, right? Mm-hmm. There's always something a little bit of a missing element. For me, it was really about survival. I was on my own at 16. I uh, had fake ID and I was dancing to stay in high school because I didn't want to get a GED. And so when I turned 18, I started working at a club that had porn stars coming in every week. And I realized, like, I wanted to do porn because I wanted to feature dance. I wanted to travel the world yeah. and dance. So daddy issues... My dad was racist, so I definitely made sure I did a shit ton of interracial. Um, (laughs) Of course, my parents didn't talk to us about sex at all, uh, but that was part of my generation growing up in the 70s, 80s. Uh And very young, I had sex because all of my friends were doing it, and I realized at a young age, like, okay, you don't have to have a boyfriend to have sex. Boys get very possessive when you start having sex with them, and it was just not my jam. So dancing freed me up and let me really experience, understand men, and then... Doing porn was like that next level of being a true exhibitionist. And the only way to make the most money on the road was doing porn. The magazine girls made a third of what the porn girls made. So Mm -hmm. as I was doing my two-year case study of the industry while I worked at Owl's, I interviewed every girl there. Like, okay, you know, how do I make the most money? How do I get on the box cover? How do I get a contract? Who don't I work with? Who do I work with? Um, and f- I just studied the money and I really followed it. Yeah. I feel like you're the kind of girl to like research how to negotiate your own kind of contract. Am I wrong? Yes. And no, like okay. when I was younger, yes. But now I'd rather pay somebody smarter than me to yeah. handle <laughs> shit and then advise me. The you know what I mean? like, yeah. Now it's like, I've got three people in my life. that are way fucking smarter than me yeah. and they help me make all the best decisions. And 
it is nice to have a team. It's so funny because before I hired my lawyer, I'd look at a contract and be like, this sounds good. I'm reading it. Like, it doesn't sound like there's anything bad. No, no. Like, there's always something bad. There's always something bad. Always. To loop back to your like depression and your anxiety, you said a big part of getting out of that was your acceptance. How did you work on acceptance? I, for example, like shrooms is what helped me get out of that. Like I have to meditate on mushrooms and it helps clear my mind. So what was your strategy? I read a lot. Uh -huh. um, I read a book a week for a year, mm -hmm. and that was a challenge for me. Uh, I read a lot about letting go, moving on, acceptance. I always have meditated, so that helps a lot as yeah. well. But really, mm -hmm. it was the study of like really influential documentaries, really just opening my mind to learn mm -hmm. and to realize like people have gone through worse situations. You know, there was a day I was sitting in the courthouse because I was going to court to try and get a restraining order against one person. And I learned a lot about court that day, and I learned that there'll be 50 more cases for each room in Los Angeles County than will ever be able to be heard. There's no way a judge could see that many. Yeah. But people will make deals in the hallway. They will surrender. And I just watch people, like, crying in the hallway, you know, just selling their life to make a decision that they don't want to go back to that building and feel that feeling again. And I just it just hit me where I was like, people have gone through a, a lot worse things than I have, and I've got to put this in perspective. At that time, it was... It's kind of suffocating me. And then yeah. when I actually looked out, I'm like, you know what? Most of the world doesn't even know this is happening to me right now. Did you ever go in like a loop? Because what I happen tend to do, and it adds to my anxiety, it adds to my depression. And I've been working with a life coach for a long time to like get myself out of these loops. But it's like a loop of why is this happening to me? Why does like God hate me? Or like, why does the universe hate me? Like, why are these things happening? And it would just, I, it would be a loop until I finally was like, actually here are all the great things that are happening for yeah. me. You have to have a gratitude journal when you're going through things that are looping, right? Mm -hmm. So taking breaks in your day to go through what you wrote down the night before in your gratitude journal, or a conversation with a friend, yeah. uh, getting out and it was nice weather. Like the simplest things when you're going through tough things, writing them down every night before you go to bed, reflecting on them during the day, and really training your brain to stop the loop. The why question is such an easy thing to let go of once you understand it. I watched a documentary of like the power of why or something, and it really made me like hit it like, oh, okay, stop asking this. You're only making it worse. You're only thinking about it more. You're only fucking bringing it closer to you. Mm -hmm. Like it's already happened. That whole theory like you can't cry over spilled milk. Yeah. But for me what was also so heavy was the fact that I had been in the business for almost 30 years and having the world blow up on me the way that it did and having so many people team up and do horrible things, it made me feel like I'd lost my identity with some people that I was casual friendships, even though they weren't like my best friends. These mm -hmm. were people that I knew for such a large part of my adult life. Yeah. So I was also going through layers of heartbreak of like people that I thought liked me that chimed in, you know, because it was so many, it was people that like I had just paid to be on my set mm -hmm. and produced movies and paid uh -huh. them and a month before and the next thing you know they're chiming in on social media about what a horrible person I am I'm like oh, I didn't see that coming it got to the point where I had to stop looking at social media for so do you think months. traumatic experiences can help you turn your life around oh fuck like how, yes. how do you utilize that experience and really grow from that uh now when somebody fucks with me I just kind of giggle in my mind I'm like oh it's gonna take <laughs> so much more than that like yeah this is not even a thing like it it was so big that now everything else seems so small yeah. And I think also if a traumatic experience forces you to be still, we're always needing to be be still from time to time, but we don't do it often. Mm -hmm. When it does, if you can hear that silence and you can dig deep and you can learn when the next time you do go through something, because we're all going to go through shit, you of know, uh, the next time you do, you're going to have a better source of resources in your brain of how to get through a little bit quicker, find your happy place, you know, yeah. move from it. A thousand percent. And when like, we went through the pandemic, it was so much easier for me than anybody else because I was like, oh, I just fucking did this for a year, okay? I know how to be still. <laughs> I signed up for a master class. I learned something every day. I took like four hours of classes online, reorganized all my hard drives. Like I just had a task list. Uh -huh. And I had just moved to New York City, December of 2019, mm -hmm. given up a car for the first time in my life. And a pandemic hits, and I'm like, I don't have a fucking car. Everybody else yeah. can go and drive it's around. Middle, it's the middle of winter too, so you're like inside. Nothing, you've got okay? you've got nothing but time. Nothing, nothing, nothing but everyone's time. Everyone's leaving the island. It's like all you would hear is the cops on horseback. You'd hear the hoofs oh, on the yeah. street. It was so eerie. Like the apocalypse like, is happening. I was like, right this is 1950 <laughs> New York City. In New York, you weren't allowed to go outside, right? No, we weren't allowed to do anything. But people were still somehow getting COVID. Oh yeah, through the apartments. Well, you know, because everyone's on top of each other. It's a very closed-in yeah, yeah. city. You're sharing elevators. Yeah, you're sharing you're doing everything. The subway. Yeah. Journey. yeah, it's. Yeah. But so you know, a lot of the things that you worry about are just normal things that women go through between twenty and thirty. 
Oh, a thousand percent. Like I had totally to learn normal. how to get out of the loop because a month ago, one of my best friends died. I'm so sorry. You know, but it's like I'm learning so much. Like at first it was like a month of me being like, I'm in this loop of just sadness, depression. Like, why did that have to happen to him? Why did it happen to one of the kindest people ever? And it's like my life coach, her mom died and that was her best friend. And she was like, that was I became so, so strong after that. And it's like once you learn how to cope, all these blessings come because everything needs to make you stronger somehow. Like, everything needs to... How did he die? Oh, fentanyl. So you should get involved in some sort of charity. Yeah, honestly, when I can afford it, like... You can even just volunteer your time and raise money through your OnlyFans and give a percentage. You can set up a page on Instagram where they collect the money directly. Mm -hmm. But if I were you, like, I do a 24-hour walk for suicide prevention in New York City every year. Oh, that's awesome. I do a walk in Huntington Beach, California for Alzheimer's research because both my grandparents had it, and I started doing it when I lived there years ago. Yeah. And so I go back and see all of my friends for that weekend. I post it on my social media, and I I can bring in, you know, like $5,000 an event, Mm -hmm. and it really, it's your way to keep that person alive in your heart and help other people that are dealing with the same thing. He was like a big dog person, like I'm a dog person, so I got all these animal rescues lined up that I'm going to make videos with that's like kind of in his honor. I would have done that anyways, but it's like now it's for him. I'm so lucky that I lived in the 90s when you could just take drugs from strangers. That's what I did. they were clean, man. I did so much (laughs) fucking ecstasy. I'm so sorry for you young people. I mean, when I was your age, I was coming here with 30 pills and... I was like, we're not leaving until we're done with these. Like, we're just going to fucking do them until we fucking die. The good old days. And then we'll drive back to fucking L.A. Oh, like we want to die for like three days. But I was so lean after those trips, too. Wow. You could do that up until like 2019. I feel like 2019 was the year that like you had to start looking. Because I would take ecstasy from strangers. I would do coke from strangers. I would never touch it. Yeah, before the pandemic, right? Before the pandemic is when like everything started going downhill. But like as a businesswoman... Okay, put myself in the mind of a drug dealer. If I kill someone, they're not a repeat client. Yeah, but most of them don't know they're getting dirty shit. Okay. You know, but you can test it now. You can buy test yeah. kits on Amazon. I have like a million test kits, not even for me because my friends are fucking stupid. Okay. I would only take mushrooms now because I don't want to like accidentally take something. I always keep uh, on hand tested ecstasy pills in large quantities in case yeah. we go to war so I can just fucking take a just bunch. Just ride it out. Woo! Just gonna fucking, we got pills in my place for everybody to come over. We're going to light some Party candles and do a shit ton of ecstasy. Everything is charged. We yeah. can run Pandora over here. We have a light show over here. So you've referred to yourself as a mattress actress. Yeah. How much of your content did you feel like you were acting in versus what you genuinely enjoyed? Good question. I didn't shoot as much as people shoot today, so yeah. I enjoyed all of my scenes. The only time I felt like I was acting was when it was a parody, and there was like a guy, and he was super nice, mm-hmm. but we just had a rough scene. His name was Guy De Silva, uh, and he did the Obama version of the Sarah Palin series. Okay. And... They put him on a horse, and he didn't want to get on the back of the horse. And then the, the guy, we're on a horse, on yeah, a canyon, yeah. on a cliff, okay? Uh-huh. This guy does not want to get on a horse. So right away, I'm like, why don't we do this after the sex? Because he's never going to be able to perform. He's shaking. So he's shaking, right? <laughs> and so they have me draped over, just sitting nicely on the back. I'm not afraid of the horse, what have you. And, and of course, you know, the guy that's out there, we had to sign the insurance if we die. Yeah. You know, nobody cares. Um, <laughs> and so the, the guy tells the director, Jerry T., whatever you do, just don't yell. Uh huh. What does Jerry do? He screams action. The horse fucking spooks. He oh no! F- I fly off. Guy flies off, and then they're like, "Okay, well, we paid for this horse. We know nobody's gonna get back on it, so we're gonna have you do this sex scene right here on a- on hay, and the horse wow. is gonna be in vision of the camera because we paid for <laughs> you it. Were right? cu- you were cucking the horse. So <laughs> now the horse is eating pieces of hay and keep coming out. Those were times where I feel I really didn't enjoy it because it was just torturous all around. Yeah. You knew how uncomfortable this person was. He's definitely going to have a hard time getting wood. Each time we get into a rhythm, the horse comes over to take some fresh hay. And You're I'm like, like looking up like... Okay, that this, would be that, straight bestiality on OnlyFans. Yeah, oh that, that wouldn't fly these that, days. PETA would PETA, PETA, PETA like, would be on your ass you know, real I always quick. Was, I always chose who I worked with. I never That's showed awesome. up to a stranger. I always met who I was going to work with before I worked with them. Mm-hmm. Um, I would ask around for references if it was somebody new in the industry, and they would have to be like vetted by 10 people that have known me for years yeah. and know what I'm into. And so I used that time to really you know, have really sexual experiences. Who are some of your favorite performers to work with, both male and female? Oh my God, that's so tough because there's so many. If I go back into the wayward land, I guess I'll just go with the era that everybody knows today, which of course Johnny Sins is always Mm -hmm. number one in everybody's book. Mm -hmm. Um, Manuel Ferrara is amazing. Mick Blue, uh, Shawn Michaels, um, Rob Black, Isaiah Maxwell I love. Um, 
Of course, Lex is legendary. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have to do a scene with Mandingo uh, just because you do. <laughs> um, just because it's a challenge. Like after I did my first scene with him, That's I'm like, right you know there. what? Shout out Mandingo. He's the OG. I'm gonna do anal with this guy just because I want to see if I can. Just because it's <laughs> do you know who so Mandingo big. is? I have no clue. Okay, you got some ass. research to do. Is it the Dread kind of dick? Like he's the OG he's Dread. He's thicker than Dread. He's like licking an ice cream cone. Like there's no oral. There's no putting it in your mouth. It's that big. Wow. I feel like I'm leaving people out, and I feel really bad about that. I mean, back in the day, Mark some Wood, of the, some of the Mr. Pete. My favorite woman to work with is Sarah J. Okay. She's the most truly sexual woman I've been with on set. She just really loves it, and you feel that chemistry with her when you're with her that she's not doing it for the camera. She's doing it because she loves it. Mm-hmm. You know, I saw Cherie yeah. fuck live with yeah. this mother. Mm-hmm. That, oh my God. I've, I've been... shot Cherie for my company, for MILFs Illustrated, but I don't mm-hmm. think I did a scene with Cherie. I think I only directed her scenes when I was producing content. She is flexible. Yeah, yeah. She's a performer. She does swing dancing on the side. So, of course, she's a great dancer. She can oh move. My God. And a scene is really a dance. Yeah. You know, it it's a, a sexual dance. dance. She was like in the Damon's ear and Kazumi's ear being like, do you like that? Like, she was doming the whole <laughs> fucking scene. Rachel Starr was fun to work with because I, re- I recycle all of my content on my OnlyFans page. So oh, yeah. I use the library of content that I own. So I get to relive these moments as I go back through. Mm-hmm. I just put I remember up a, that. I put I up a scene with one. Romy and I'm like, oh my God, I still remember when I got me and Romy those blue outfits. I was probably like 2010, <laughs> uh, 2011. So my scenes, I have old, old stuff. Um, Suze gave me all of my vintage content from mm-hmm. the early 90s. And those were just magazines. We didn't shoot on film yet for... Yeah. And there was no penetration because we weren't allowed to sell penetration yet in a magazine. So like yeah. every guy's got to be like this far apart, but it's lit so perfectly. <laughs> so was there sex still happening in the like the soft core? Was it still kind of so there was no sex happening? Court? Nobody would have sex, but, but. Um, I wanted to work with Rocco Sofredi so bad mm-hmm. in the early '90s. And at the time, you know, Rocker was uh, always been incredibly smart. Mm-hmm. He owned his foreign rights, so no matter who he would work for. He would own the cable rights and everything for overseas. Wow. The company I was contracted with would not go for that. They're like, no, we make way too much money on mm. our foreign rights. So I couldn't work with him on film. So I, I said, Suze, you know, can you book us a magazine together? And will you let us fuck, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and so loophole. There's Suze always loophole. <laughs> put a camera on the floor, shot video of it. So I have like old school clips of it. Um, but it was always when she was like relighting. So she would make us like move to a different area because... We couldn't mess up the bed and the lights uh-huh. and everything yeah. else. Um, but yes, so once. Okay, that's, that's a good friend right there. Yeah, I know. Susan and I were tight like that. Both, you know, Lakers <laughs> games. And like, you let me fuck Rocco because I'm not allowed to on camera. Right. So Suze, she's talking about is, uh, it's Holly Randall's mom. Oh, no yeah. way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Holly Randall has been in the business mm-hmm. basically since birth because of her mom. Yeah. And then she just now has access to all porn stars. Yeah. Big podcast. That's awesome. And I've watched her, you know, grow up. Yeah. She was a teenager when I first started shooting with Suze. Oh, my God. And Suze took really good care of me, and Suze really empowered me as a woman. I started shooting magazines with Suze, and then I did a, a kind of a circuit where mm-hmm. I shot with all these male photographers, and they were all, like, hella creepy <laughs> and hella annoying. It's, it's still the same these days, so, it's, so it's, nothing's I, changed I on I that side I remember going back to Suze's <laughs> studio in Santa Monica and being like, you know what, Suze, like, I didn't feel comfortable on those sets. So what do I do? And she's like, you're popular. You tell all the companies if you want to shoot, if you want it be in magazines, uh, they'll all, all only shoot with Suze. And so I was like, let's see if this works, right? Yeah. So I just went to everybody. I'm like, oh, you want to buy a layout? Like, I'm only shooting with Suze. So then we exclusively shot together for about 15 years. That is fucking awesome. There are, like, all these photographers who DM me on Instagram, and it's like, you can just tell that they're weird. Yeah, and, like, some of the guys, like, I was, you know, Suze taught me, like, when you're moving to another area and they're telling you to change your hair and doing things, you're shooting another set. Mm-hmm. So these guys would hustle, like, six magazine layouts in one day. Okay. And so to me, like, I wanted the press, like, I wanted to be, I was in magazines every other month for, like, 10-year stretch, Mm -hmm. right? And this is when you used to be able to go in the valley to the stands on the corner, and they weren't wrapped in plastic, so you'd go to see what was out, like, every fucking month. You'd be like, okay, what am I in this month? But, you know, that's just hustling you, because you're only making $500 a day, and they're having you on set for, like, 14 hours shooting six layouts. So I just also knew they were scamming the fuck out of me. Yeah. And I was like, all right, you know what? They're getting uh, more bang for the buck on that Yeah, you were a one and done. Yeah. We're done now, and we'll never shoot together again. I remember seeing them year after year at trade shows, and them just hating me, because they knew I was getting Sue's all that work. Mm Mm-hmm. As someone who was in the industry for years, does size matter to you? It does not. Wow. It does not. It's really about 
the connection that you have with your partner. Yeah. Sure, there's like Mandingo size that like I have to do this just to know. Just it's a just mental to know challenge. If you can shoot it in there. Can I do this? It's, <laughs> it's like shooting a free throw can, behind can, your head. Can I so, ride this ride? Yeah, can I ride this ride? But like, could I imagine having that in my everyday life and being like, it's Tuesday and I want to climb on that like every day? Yeah. No. So I've really learned it's about the connection you have with somebody. I think being in porn for as many years as I was mm -hmm. made me a lot more connected in my personal life and things are more intimate intimate for me like touching and kissing that speaks greater volumes to me than a, a size right mm -hmm. and so and also like I'm not an aggressive person I don't like to be choked I don't like okay. really I don't like any of that so like if a guy does that then I'm like I don't care if I love your dick like I'm just not into that uh -huh. so it's really about the connection so you said on Stiff Socks that Gravy fucked like a porn star. He did because he had some good height. He was able to pick me up and move me around my apartment and put me in places I hadn't <laughs> fucked yet. So I was like, you know what, the height. And also he could titty fuck me and I'd be like standing up. Like the whole thing. The height thing was just a wild ride. You know yeah. what I mean? So that's like the porn star part. Is there yeah, anything? the porn star part is picking me up. Also, the porn star part is being able to do it multiple times in a row. Because yeah. he's super young. You know what I mean? He can still go, go like four or five times in <laughs> a row. Do men when they're older not be able to do that? Not as often. I've found younger guys are more likely to be able to be like, okay, I can do it again in two minutes or, you know, yeah. Younger guys are more likely to be like, hey, I'm going to come now, but don't worry. We could do this three or four more times and you're not afraid. Older and guys, older, older guys, guys like, they do need not fucking come now. <laughs> do not fucking, do, 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 get away. Do not come. So <laughs> older guys. They're, they're already thinking about that sandwich and the nap afterwards. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So it does transition. Don't waste your youth. Not experience, but you know what? You can get more younger guys when you're older and they're afraid of you, so they don't fuck with you. That's what I've heard because, like, younger guys fuck great with cougars, but younger guys with younger girls, like, they, they they're just, annoying, they're so fucking annoying, right? Younger guys don't text first, they're afraid, yeah, they're afraid to catch you at a bad time. They want to stay on your good side. You'll reach out to them, you will text them. How do you train a younger guy to be like, This, this is how you fuck. Or do you not like to do that? I do have a talk with guys before I have sex for the first time, especially if they're younger. Because, like, I want to know, like, what do you normally watch? You know what I mean? If you watch <laughs> yeah. Brazzers and Only Brazzers, then you're going to think it's proper to step into this and start banging the fuck out of me right away. Uh -huh. That's not going to work. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, you know, you're going to ease into this situation. We're yeah. going to make out. We're going to pet each other a bit. Gonna We're going to slowly disrobe each other. We're not in a hurry. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And so I usually gather a bit of data. I like to have not a So there's order, like an like, intake interview? There's an intake interview. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I was the same. I say the same thing to everybody. Like, do not choke me or hold me down. I am a willing participant. I want to be here. If you are acting like I'm trying to get away, that's a fucking problem. Okay? <laughs> don't mark me and don't do anything that makes me have to stab you. I will stab you. So I make it very clear ahead of time. That's Especially cool. a younger guy. Younger guys, I feel like, are easier. They're, like, scared of you, so they're not going to be like, oh, fuck that. Like and I've fucked a couple of guys in the past year that after our, like, second and third time together, I said, you know what? We should just be tent friends. Like, we're not fucking compatible mm -hmm. like you might be enjoying it but i'm not so <laughs> let's just be friends have you ever like sent a picture to a guy of your vibrator after to be like i'm just not i'm just not feeling nah i'm afraid to send anybody personal photos because i'm afraid they'll share them with their friends and put them online and though all of my other shit is online yeah if i found out i tried to do you gotta something hold something special to yourself for something <laughs> yeah. and they post and they posted it i would be like and it happened to me once. Like, damn it, there's, there's my Once in my life. And this mm -hmm. motherfucker, I cannot get him off my Wikipedia page and it bothers me. <laughs> once, a kid from Notre Dame, he was going to college. He was on break. Uh -huh. I took him to a Knicks game. We went back to my place. He was 18. He took a selfie of us in bed and it got to TMZ and it got everywhere. And it became this big deal. And I just was like, wow, that was so personal. I was in bed. I had no makeup on. We were like, I, yeah. and he sent it to his friends. His friends sent it to everybody. Next thing you know, it's on fucking Barstool. It's on Bleach Reports, like fucking everywhere. And I'm like, that was not good. So I just don't want my personal life exposed that way. Yeah, you like to keep some things private. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I'll get there one day. But for now, for now, I like to tell everyone everything. <laughs> <laughs> Spencer, the, do you have questions for me? Do you have any questions? Since you're an industry veteran, someone say an OG, how do you see the industry, how it's changed the past few years as opposed to when you first came to the industry in the 90s? So, or what are the different levels of the industry been progressed through the years you see? I've seen everything, of course, from just shooting on film, VHS, to like me thinking CDs were the greatest thing because I could pack so many more on the road without damaging the boxes. Like I remember how exciting that was. VHS, 
you'd show up with your stuff in your suitcase. You'd be like, do you want to buy this? The whole thing's like crushed. Saw him, saw him out of the trunk. Um, like, you know, I've watched that whole time difference. So it would shoot, uh, take hours to shoot something on film versus once we went digital. Uh-huh. We had a lot of power in the early days. You know, the, the men in the business would tell you, like, we need you to stay here. Like, don't ever do something you don't want to do. Don't work with somebody you don't want to work with. Be connected with the people you have sex with. Don't do something on camera you haven't done in your personal life. Like, this is how they spoke to us. Mm -hmm. They really empowered us. Wow. And, you know, we really got away from that. And then the internet really demanded so many scenes. And no one was giving information anymore. It was like a girl was showing up, oh, you have a boy-girl scene tomorrow. Mm -hmm. She doesn't know who she's working with, what his style is, are they going to connect, does she feel safe with him? Yeah. Is he doing drugs on his free Because they're, they're just time? printing money at that point. They're just trying to put out scenes. So if you're just like not doing that quality control, you know, you're just more worried about the money than more, the oversight yeah. and the safety of the performers. It's quantity so. over quality. Of course. And that affected the performers in such a great way. And now I think with OnlyFans, we've kind of cycled back to the empowerment phase again where, mm -hmm. hey, now that I'm making money in my OnlyFans, I still want to shoot scenes for their companies, but I'm not going to work for those people that made me feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Or I'm not going to work for somebody that had me work with a guy that I didn't like working with. I want to yeah. have choices. So I think the power is definitely back in the performer's hands. I do think, though, that we're on a slippery slope with OnlyFans, and I do... You know, it won't be here forever. Nothing mm -hmm. ever is. And there's a lot of like areas where I see risk and I see risk with girls who escort and use their OnlyFans to market that because that's something OnlyFans is definitely against. I also uh. see girls who are having people answer their messages. Mm -hmm. And now there's threads on Reddit where these guys, they, they're in this intense, they're intense incels, but they'll go to an event when a girl's standing there and they'll talk with her on camera. So they'll be shooting a video. Meanwhile, these guys on Reddit are DMing her on her OnlyFans and somebody's answering them right away. And what's that showing is you're breaking the ordinance of OnlyFans because no one's allowed to be seeing your messages. These are personal messages. Yeah. That's why I won't let somebody else run my page. And yeah. I understand people are busy, but if people feel they're being scammed and they get together and go to the credit card processors, that's going to be a problem. Yeah. So it's not forever. So what I'm hoping is people are not only putting their content on OnlyFans, but they're backing it up, whether mm -hmm. it's a cloud, a hard drive, what have you. Yeah. And also maybe having a secondary website. I've had a website since like 1997, and I still have content on that site. Yeah. It's not time sensitive. People are going to learn about you that knew about you or didn't know about you. So I think it's changed in the whole machinery of it. It's also spread out more. Mm -hmm. We all lived in the valley at one time. <laughs> now it's <laughs> L.A., it's Vegas. People live wherever they live. People are shooting in people's homes. I think there's a little bit more risk uh, because I don't think people are as intense about paperwork and testing with this OnlyFans trade. Like, I always had my credit card down at every testing center. The day before a scene with me, you had to test. Guys loved it because they got a free test that they were going to ride for the next two weeks, uh -huh. right? But for me, it was like, I just want to know that even though you tested on Monday and our scenes on Friday, you could have done six scenes and three other things at home. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of risk to me. Yeah. So I think that there's like some opening of risk mm -hmm. by performers, not as much, but by outside people coming into OnlyFans and never had It's a bigger out pool paperwork. now for sure. Yeah. Compared They've to never filled out paperwork on yeah. set. Mm -hmm. They don't know the legality of it all. They don't know the risk factor if they don't have the right paperwork. Let's say in 10 years, one of these girls that did OnlyFans stuff with a friend decides she wants to be a lawyer and she wants this shit scrubbed from the internet. She can go after that person. There's a lot yeah. more liability as a producer. Uh -huh. You are a producer when you have an OnlyFans. Mm -hmm. The other big change is we've become obtainable in a way that I feel shouldn't be. You okay. know, it was a big thing that we were always a fantasy. We weren't mm -hmm. obtainable. We stayed in this group of people and didn't really mix. And now that every girl, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to stop being on the road was I would spend half of my Polaroid line negotiating with dudes who mm -hmm. were like, well, you know, the last girl that was here, I went back to her hotel, I give her 700 bucks, you know, and then I, now I'm grossed out by the last girl. Now yeah. I know everybody knows where my hotel is. Mm -hmm. And every guy just assumed I was a hooker because everybody else was a hooker. And I was like, you think I'm fucking working this hard yeah. to fucking then need more money? Like, the, where, where's the where's the line here? And so I would check into hotels there'd already be guys sitting in the lobby. Because <laughs> no. every girl before me was a hooker. Scandalous. So like, I was the only one. And so I tried not to get mad at people because I get it, the last 10 girls did it. But I don't love that we've removed that barrier between us being a fantasy. Mm -hmm. When guys ask me and my OnlyFans about hooking up, I always say shit like, you think that MJ walks by a park and jumps in on a pickup game? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I try to make light of it because I don't want to offend somebody, but it's true. Michael Jordan is not fucking playing a pickup game. You gotta play in comparison. Yeah, you gotta Why put am I in... fucking you? Oh, no, doesn't even not the money. Just the fact that I'm gonna fuck you. Like, yeah. I wouldn't. So. so speaking of pro athletes, how do you see pro athletes being similar to porn stars at an elite level? Are there some similarities? For good with that? porn stars like us, right? Um, you know, we always looked at our bodies like a temple. You know, for me, everything from how I ate, how I lived, how I rested, took care of our skin. For women, hair, mm -hmm. nails, all of that. But we are the same. You're going to be on the bench if you're not healthy. And so you have to be training all the time to have endurance for the scenes, to continue to do them different, you know, all the different workbenches. You could be on a kitchen island one day, the next day you're on a couch. Yeah, like, there's a lot, lot of different arenas. A lot of different workbenches. You know arenas, what I mean? Yeah. Like, so your body has to be conditioned to be like, yeah. one leg has to be strong. You know <laughs> what I mean? Because you might be doing something with one leg up. So I think it's really the same. And then the movement. You know, athletes are on the road, you yeah. know, so many months a year. For us, it became being on the road. You'd fly out here to Vegas. Like, when I would shoot in Vegas, I would have to fly in the day before because I'd want to go to cryo. I want to get my inflammation down. Mm -hmm. I want to get a good night's sleep. I do not want to fly and then feel sexy on a, on a set. Yeah. So that, that travel also wears on your body. And I think it's similar in the sense that you're making most of your money in a very condensed period of time in your life when you're younger. Uh -huh. And I then you might not have a shit ton of opportunity after. So just like athletes who mm -hmm. can be, you know, jaw. I mean, throwing a fucking ton of money down at that strip club. I know 50 grand is nothing to jaw, but still one day jaw might be like, man, 50 grand is a lot of money. You well, he right might now? have supported some people that were there that were the recipients of that. So, you know, that could be good too. It is true, but I he's, bet he's, you. He's supporting the economy. I bet you there's some people that he knows that can use that more. Probably a little friends. more. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a local school. You know what I mean? Okay, that, you yeah. know, he could have just the kids, stopped 10 kids and take still, priority. still being generous. So I always said we were like sexual Olympians, yeah. right? And to be the top of your game, to be able to be on the road as a feature dancer, I had to be in shape because you're, yeah. you're dancing. That's not keeping you in shape. You still have to go to the gym. You got to be strong. Uh -huh. Your body has to be healthy so you don't bruise. Yeah. You know, all of those little things make a huge difference. But I think we're very much like athletes. And to be good at what we do, the best performers have a routine. Mm -hmm. What they do in the morning, the day of a shoot, how they eat, how they rest the night before. The people that are winging it are never the best performers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you find a difference in the way other people treat you outside of the industry since it's become more mainstream? I do. And, and I also feel like I went through a period of time when you're insulated inside the business, you're seeing out, right? And when you see out, you assume that everybody knows what you're doing every day and all that's in your world is porn. So you figure that everybody that looks at you is thinking of porn. Uh -huh. Then when you step out and you're looking in, it becomes very different. Mm -hmm. And you realize... You know, people are really as cool to you as you are to them. Not everybody is the worst case scenario. And getting into the sports world, I was so pleasantly surprised at how welcoming everybody was, mm -hmm. how non-creepy everybody was, how cool, how just people are more accepting. And for me to be out there, I've had so many conversations with people through sports that have been like, it's so cool getting to know you. Because you're authentic because that's who you are. So that's right. the fabric of who you are. So people will respect that and realize that. So they take you seriously because yeah. you love sports. You grew and up on sports. So it's, they, it's you. So it's less, they can accept that. They tell me they'll be less judgmental or more open minded when they come and cross paths with other people from the industry. So like, oh, you've changed my whole, you know, preconceived like you're, you're notion. You're normal people. Yeah. yeah you like, other oh my hobbies? God, you're fucking you don't just people. suck dick. Right. <laughs> what? And I think that's really important. You know, we all need to be a pace car for something. And I think it's so great me being out in the world and with having still people in the industry on my podcast mm -hmm. and, and, and doing events like Exotica and AVN. Bringing my worlds all together, now everybody's like, oh, fuck it. We just accept it all. I'm like, exactly. Yeah. Just accept it all. Exactly. People are like, you whore. And it's like, is that really a bad thing anymore? <laughs> it, yeah. And I mean, it's what you project in your everyday, right? Yeah, exactly. There's a lot of mean people out there, but most of them are just not getting fucked enough. So that's their problem. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, what do you have to say to the mean people out there? What do you have to say? Oh, my God. How can I we wish, make them I, unmean? To the mean people out there, I really wish in all of my dreams that you had more sex <laughs> and that your sex life was more satisfying and gratifying because that would simmer you down a lot. Now, if that's not an option, I do suggest you start taking edibles every day of the rest of your life and maybe that will chill you out enough to want to engage with the opposite sex. But I think it's sex. It's also like judging people, what's the point, right? Meeting people and being curious about people is the best way to live. And yeah. people that aren't curious are more likely to be judgmental. Mm -hmm, exactly. Well, on that note, thank you so much for coming on. Say all your social media, any new projects you have coming up, anything you want to plug. 
now is your time to shine. All right, all my social media is the same at the release and a new wine line coming out soon. I will have a red and a white dropping by spring. My also audio book coming out in the spring and subscribe to my podcast, The Lee Sand Experience. Woo! It steals dot com for everything. Spencer Michael Barrick here on Instagram. On Twitter, I am the Damon Dice. If you want to find the freaky stuff, go to my OnlyFans at Damon Dice 8. Thank you so much. Bye. See ya.